All right, so my first question today is, among all of you, who are the people that are using renal diet to, man to manage renal patients? Raise your hand. That's what I ex expected. Most of you are using renal diet, and you're very good at doing so, because nutrition is definitely a very important way to manage patients with renal disease. However, you should not forget that there is other legs to the treatment, for example, removing the uremic toxin, for example, uh, improving the fluid balance, electrolyte balance, and acid ba balance. I say that because it's important for me as a nutritionist, because if this is not corrected, the patient won't eat. And if the patient won't eat, nutrition won't, will not help that patient. What are our targets in the management of patients with renal disease? The first one is to slow down the progress of the disease. As you probably know, and as it has been mentioned this morning, the renal disease, at least at the stage you tend to diagnose this, is a self-perpetuating disease, which means that it will progress and you will not be able to stop it or remove a cause that could stop it. The important other thing is to maintain the quality of life of those patients because no quality of life in a vet patient is really not a good way to treat those patients. Oh, does nutrition can help you that? There are a few nutrients that we know will help to slow down the progression of renal disease, and this is especially the phosphorus and the phosphate, then the long chain omega-3 fatty acid, and finally, the antioxidant. On the other side, energy, protein, electrolytes, that is sodium, chloride, potassium, acid-base balance, magnesium, and B vitamins are nutrients that are improving the quality of life, that are improving the clinical condition of those patients. Okay, you're gonna tell me, I went to a meeting about nutrition and renal disease 10 years ago, and the person just say exactly what you say. And I have to be honest with you, yes, there was no revolution in the last, in the last 10 years about nutrition and renal disease. However, a lot of work has been done, especially in trying to understand, understand the pathophysiology of renal disease, and especially its association with what we call now the bone and mineral disorder. That is the association with the change in calcium, phosphorus, and all the hormones that are involved in those uh, two uh, nutrients metabolism. Based on that information, what we hope to do in a very near future is to be able to recommend individualized management for those patients. Dr. Elliot this morning, for example, told you that when the hormone FGF23 is increasing, you should probably decrease phosphorus. At this stage, we cannot prove it, but that's what we hope to do. The other important information is that in the past, we were told that a patient with renal disease will progress and will die from that renal disease. As we are now able to pick them up earlier, what we realize is that some cats or dogs will be very stable and they will not die from renal disease. Some will progress but at a very slow rate and some will progress quickly. The only issue is today we cannot identify those animals early. And then finally, in the last few years, we have new tool that allow us to make an earlier diagnosis. As I will tell you on the next slide, most of us, uh, and probably most of you, are making a diagnosis of renal disease at a bit of a late stage. No, we have tool that allow us to make a diagnosis of, a, of renal disease at stage two, stage one, as I will show you on the next slide. SDMA is one of the marker, not perfect one, and then, as you were mentioned this morning, 
there is a new technology that will probably allow us to target population at higher risk of uh, renal disease. That's what everybody call artificial intelligences. What we do there is take information about thousands and thousands of animals and those that get renal disease and don't get. And then the software, the algorithm, find a relationship between the two and say, okay, this cat is at higher risk. This cat is at lower risk. So once again, this is something that we should see soon. All right. So for those of you that were at the presentation of Dr. Elliot this morning, he already mentioned IRIS. What IRIS has done is a staging system of renal disease. It divides renal disease in four stages. Stage one being renal disease that cannot really be diagnosed easily. Stage four being end stage renal disease. Stage two beginning to be the, the first uh, signs of uh, change in the biochemistry of the blood, and stage three, when you begin, begin to see real clinical signs. So basically, I would, uh, su I would think that most of you, when you make a diagnosis of renal disease today, you are in that area. You can see that the most important component of that staging is creatinine, and so you have the value here that separates the different stages. And so why is staging important? It because it allows us to make recommendations for those different, different stages, and recommendation especially for the diet and, and recommendation for the drugs. I just mentioned a minute ago SDMA. So SDMA is a new marker of uh, renal disease. And there is some evidence that SDMA would uh, allow us to make a diagnosis of renal disease earlier than creatinine. And so at this stage, it is recommended that a cat that has, a, that has a SDMA below 14 uh, should be checked because it might be in stage one renal disease. Or well, dog, actually. OK, let's speak about nutrients. So as already mentioned to you, the most important nutrients in the management of renal disease is phosphorus or phosphate. And there was a lot of discussion about that issue in the, end of, in the middle of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. At that time, there was a big war between the proponent of phosphorus versus the proponent of protein. And that was not only true in the vet medicine, but also in medical medicine. This is why Delmar Finko, oops, sorry, I did, yeah, Finko, did receive a $1 million grant to try to answer that question. And basically, what he took is 48 dogs, laboratory dogs, and he created a model of renal disease. This is probably something that would not be a law anymore, but at that time it was quite common, and basically, what did it? It was removing one kidney of those dogs and then imaging the other one. And so those dogs, after the surgery, would only have one 16, that is about 6% of their renal function left. He divided those dogs in four groups, half of them being fed a high or low protein diet or high or low phosphorus diet. And then he followed them up for 24 months two full years. So you can see that even with only 6% of uh, renal function left, most of those dogs were still alive after those two years. Now, when you look and you separate the effect of the phosphorus versus the effect of the protein, you can see that the dog that did receive the lowest phosphorus content, one gram by 1,000 calorie or 0.4%, survived much better 15 of the 24 were still alive after two years. The one that did receive the highest phosphorus level, 1.4% or 3.75 gram of phosphorus by 1,000 megacalorie, there was only one third that was still alive after one year. The other very important information is that there was no difference between dogs fed 16 or 32%. So this was one of the nice studies that definitely show 
that protein was not the most important factor in the progression of renal disease. This data fit very well with a research that has been done on clinical animals. Here you have a study on dogs. This is the number of dogs that did had uremic crisis. And this is the time. And what you can see on the lower, on the highest phosphorus, those dogs have much more uremic crisis than on the low phosphorus diet. In this case, this is for cats. And here, you have survival curve. So you can see that cats that were on higher phosphorus die faster than on the lowest phosphorus. And like that, it doesn't look like much. But basically, if you take the time when the dog, 50% of the dog had an uremic crisis, you can see that it was about 250 days in the high phosphorus group, but it was 600 days in the low phosphorus group. Same for the cat. You can see that the survival of 50% of the cat was 260 days versus more than 600 days on the low phosphorus diet. Now, renal diets have more than only reduction of phosphorus. There is omega-3 fatty acids, there is uh, highly digestible protein, etc. But yet, all the studies that have been done, they always go in the same direction. If you have a lower phosphorus diet, you survive better, you have a longer life expectancy on the low phosphorus diet. Okay, here I make a little hint to a, a presentation that, was, that will be much more complete by Dr. Elliot later today, and that's to show you the influence of uh, the dietary phosphorus on uh, the, 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 what we call the bone mineral disorder of those dogs, the abnormality that you can find in patients with renal disease. So here, you have two groups of patients with renal disease. The difference is that group did receive a renal diet, and that group did not receive a renal diet. What you can see is that the group that did receive a renal diet has a significant decrease in plasma phosphorus, has a significant decrease in plasma PTH, and has a significant decrease in plasma FGF23, all of which are very good for patients with renal disease, indicate that those patients are less at risk of progressing with renal disease. But you will hear much more about that later on. So why phosphorus matter? It's because of that cycle. If you have a decrease in glomerular filtration rate, you have a decrease in filtration of the phosphorus. It means that less phosphorus is excreted in urine, and thus that phosphorus tend to accumulate in the plasma. If phosphorus and also serum. If the phosphorus is accumulating in the serum, the body doesn't like that, and so it's gonna take measure so that to reduce the level of phosphorus in the plasma by secreting hormones and you back to stage one where you are within normal limit for the phosphorus. But you know, renal disease progress, and so this cycle is gonna go and go and go until the kidney is no longer able to compensate. And at that time, the organism will not be able to reduce the phosphorus in the plasma, and you will have all the issue what is which, which are associated with the accumulation of phosphorus calcium in the uh, blood of those individuals, and that will conduct to death eventually. Now you're gonna tell me what is a safe level of phosphorus in the diet of patients with renal disease. What I can tell you is this is the level of phosphorus that you will find in, in diet that are uh, made for patients with renal disease, and those diets have been uh, associated with improvement of the condition of patients with renal disease. A point that is important is that it's not only phosphorus that matter, but also the ratio of calcium to phosphorus. In the gut, calcium can bind with phosphorus. So if you have much more calcium, that means less phosphorus will be able to be absorbed. So when you have a higher ratio, 
that will decrease the absorption of phosphorus. This is the value for the canine, canine diet. As you can see, they can be lower. They are lower. It's due to the fact. <laughs> it is due to the fact that um, we can put less protein in canine diet. They need less protein, and a lot of the phosphorus is coming from the protein. And finally, you might be aware that because now we have tools to make a diagnosis of early renal disease, there are some renal early renal disease diet that are on the market, not everywhere. And you can see that more or less they decided to go as low as a patient with renal disease, but not all. And we are that value because we believe that at this stage, it's not safe to give a very low phosphorus diet to patients at very early stage of renal disease until we know better. All right, that was phosphorus, and if there was only one thing that you would learn about this presentation, that's the one. So, you know, you can rest now. So, next one is omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid. Those, as you know, are essential fatty acid, and the only difference between the two is that the double bond here is on the sixth carbon of that fatty acid from the omega site, the terminal carbon, or on the third carbon from that omega site. So you see those two molecules are very, very much the same, yet when they are used by the body, when we say when they are metabolized by the body, they will produce compounds that have a very different activity. And the omega-3 tends to have compounds that have a less, anti uh, that have an anti-inflammatory uh, effect versus here it's more a pro-inflammatory effect. Okay. Also, in the last few years, people have identified two family of molecules, the resolvin and the protectin, that can be synthesized from EPA and from DHA, and those molecules are used by the body to stop inflammation. We used to believe that inflammation would go away on its own, just like if you have a hose in fire, eventually the fire will stop. Now we know it's not true, and that those molecules are actually the firemen they stop the inflammation because sometimes inflammation can be very damaging for the organism. You can get omega-3 fatty acid from grain like flaxseed or soy. You can them from fish and no from algae. The difference is that those grain produce relatively short fatty acid, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid. We have EPA and DHA are found directly in the fish or in the algae. If you go on the internet and then you look at all the studies that show benefits of omega-3 fatty acid, they were all based on fish oil. Yet, you see many products for human consumption that say they are high in omega-3 fatty acid and they're basically using this kind of grain like the flaxseed grain. The problem is, whoops, sorry, I went too fast. The problem is, this metabolic pathway is not as efficient. It has to go to that step, and that step is very slow. Okay, so you don't produce as much EPA DHA if you give that source of fatty acid than when you use EPA DHA that can be used by the individual right away as a source of anti-inflammatory. All right, so those are study that were done again in animal model, where you can see here the time and the uh, uh, GFR, the, the filtration uh, by the kidney. You can see that with the red line, which is the EPA DHA, the fish oil, it's flat. That if you use a saturated fat like beef tallow, it's a little bit, uh, it's not as good, but it's still quite good. And then the worst is omega 6 fatty acid. Okay. Also, this is a, a large retrospective study that looked at patients that did receive a, a renal diet and look at how long they, they or not, patients with renal disease that did receive or not a renal diet, and look at the survival. And you can see the survival of the patient that received a renal diet was much larger, and all those diets 
do contain EPA and DHA. So we don't know exactly why EPA and DHA helps the renal condition, but the hypothesis is it decreases the glomerular pressure in the kidney. Uh, in a kidney where you have less nephron, there is more work for each nephron. And when there is more work, there is more pressure, and so EPA and DHA would help to relieve that pressure. Okay, the last one that could help against the progression of renal disease are antioxidants. As you already have heard, renal disease is an inflammatory disease, and when you have inflammation, you have a production of free radical, and free radical are oxidant, and they can induce inflammation, and so it's a vicious cycle. Studies have shown that indeed, in patients with uh, renal disease, you have an increased uh, marker of oxidation, uh, which is the, the increase reduced to uh, reduce, not reduced glutathione, and an increase in total antioxidant, decrease in an total antioxidant capacity. So for, to relieve that, what we do is to give various antioxidants. It's very important to, do, to give more than one because each antioxidant has I its own target. It can be the membrane, it can be the cytoplasm, it can be the nucleus. So by giving a cocktail of this antioxidant, then you can be more efficient in reducing uh, that, uh, the, that problem. All right, now what are the nutrients that are gonna help us to improve the quality of life? The first one is energy. I'm sure that among you patients with renal disease, you have observed that they tend to lose weight, the more so that the stage is advanced. What you have observed also is that in patients with renal disease, you have a dec decrease in appetite, or no appetite at all in purple. There are very many reasons to explain why a patient in renal disease don't want to eat, but I won't have the time to go to all of those, so I will focus on two. The first one is the palatability of the diet. Of course, because of its design, renal diets are not the most palatable diet we will never be able to be as good as a maintenance diet uh, for, for, uh, for dogs and cats. The reason being is one, we have to decrease the amount of protein. And dogs and cats like protein. More so, we have to use protein that do not contain much bone, because bones is bringing phosphorus. And that's the protein that dogs and cats like, because that's the one that is tasty. You know, that's, if I say to you, you prefer bacon on plain tofu, of course, initially, you're gonna tend to go on bacon. But we can make a tofu more pleasant, and so this is the job of our uh, people that are working for palatability that are making those diets more and more palatable. So my recommendation for you is that you should not change a dog's or a cat's on a renal diet from one day to the other. You should go progressively so that he learned to use it, and he learns to like it. Okay. The second issue is food aversion. So I don't know if you know the term, but I'm sure that 90% in this room have experienced food aversion, or I should say liquid aversion, one time in their life. Usually it's a liquid with alcohol, you drank a lot of it, you felt very sick, and the next day forever, that smell makes you sick. Even without touching the bottle, you don't want to eat. You can have exactly the same thing with food. And the issue with patients with renal disease is that's a disease in which you can get nauseous, you can vomit, and so there is a big risk. When you have aversive, what you are aversive to is the taste and the smell. So you can make exactly the same diet, but change the taste and the smell, then the animal will accept it. Okay, and that's why we and other have a rather large range of renal diets so that you can change diet to satisfy 
uh, you animal and make sure that they want to eat the food. Yes, I forgot one thing. When you do, your cat or dog is aversive, it's probably because he's not feeling well. So first fix it. And when you have fixed it, then propose a new diet. Because if you give it too early, then you're gonna make it aversive to the next one. And thus that's one less diet that you will be able to use. All right, so if the cat or the dog doesn't wanna eat, what do I do? So I'm gonna ask you your question, your question. You sick, I can treat you, but I don't wanna feed you. What do you do? You wanna be fed. I mean, really, and that's something that I encourage you to do. If someone goes from your family in the hospital with bad disease, with cancer, etc., please ask them to check that you, you, she is eating something. And if that person doesn't eat, then you need to put the tubes. And I know it seems to be a little bit aggressive, but that's something that works extremely well. I know that there was some lab work this morning teaching you how to put a nasogastric tube, or you can see here a nosophagostomy tube, that is a tube that is put through the neck into the esophagus. People that do it, I don't do it myself, say it's very easy to place, but it needs some uh, surgery. The big advantage of that one is that the tube is bigger. So either you can use a liquid diet, but you can also use a canned food with some water, or you can use dry food with more water. And all of that will go to that tube. As you can see, this cat looks very stressed. You know, this is a cat that went home, and owner can follow. If the cat doesn't drink enough, you can put water in the tube. If the cat doesn't want to take its drug, you can put the drug in its tube. So for the quality of life, this is working very well for the pet and for the owners. You know, because the owner, seeing that his cat or dog doesn't want to eat every day, it's a, it's a big issue. And to demonstrate to you that it works, this is a work that was done uh, by Sherry Ross. And what you can see, she put a zephagosomy tube and she looked at the body condition over time. And you can see that all those cats, 19 cats, at the end of the 12 months period, that gain weight. So this is what you want in a, a, a patient, whatever its condition, if it doesn't want to eat, the only strategy that works is the tube. And I know it's scary to put the first one, but when you will put one, you'll see you will use it in many patients. All right, we already spoke about that to say that no, protein is not the most important factor in the progression of renal disease. This is something that has been said for decades. This is something that you will still find in most textbooks, but that's true, that it's not true. Protein is not the main factor in the progression of renal disease. No, there is some confusion because as I mentioned to you already, protein can also bring phosphorus, especially if it's an animal protein, there will be bone in it and thus phosphorus. Now that we know that protein is not as important in the progression of renal disease, some people are saying we don't give enough protein in patients with renal disease, especially cats. The big issue is that all the diets that have been shown to be efficacious in cats with renal disease were all diet with what they call low but moderate protein diet. So if someone wants to do the work, it can be studied to see what is the maximum level of protein that can be tolerated by those cats, as I will discuss with you in a second. So when we say giving protein in a patient with renal disease, what we need to look at is the balance between the amount of amino acid that the animal eats for protein synthesis and other synthesis, and the excess that could induce uremia. So we need to find, right, to find that uh, right balance, and it probably depends on the stage of the disease. Now I'm gonna tell you a secret. Dogs and cats and you don't need protein. You need amino acids. Okay, it's just a question of word, 
because on the protein is a chain of amino acid. But when you think about that, you realize that for the body to be allowed to use those amino acids, the protein has to be digested. So you can put plenty of protein in your diet, but yet not bringing more amino acid to the animal. And the big issue is that all those proteins that have not been digested here, what are they going to do? They're going to go in a colon. And what's going to happen to them in a the colon? They're going to be fermented. Fermentation of protein is called putrefaction. So it gives you already a feel for how oh, bad all the toxins that are produced in that. Toxin that's going to be absorbed and uh, will be responsible for the uremic signs. The other thing that is very important is that we all need 10 essential amino acids. If one is lacking, it's like not getting any protein. If one is limiting, like here, it limits the use of all the other amino acid in the diet. So that means that all those amino acids will be discarded and destroyed because the body cannot store amino acid, and so if it's not using it to make protein synthesis, it's catabolized. And then, I already mentioned all the things about amino acid, but then we have what we call the non-protein nitrogen. For example, the nucleotide, the nucleotic basis, creatinine, amines, all those compounds, they can be used in the colon to produce many of those compounds that have been shown uh, to be associated with uremic toxin. So here, what we need to do is to use protein of quality that is are highly digestible and do not contain too much of those compounds. And that, for example, the benefits of vegetable protein, because vegetable protein are very low in those compounds and they are very digestible. The issue is that they are not extremely palatable, so we have to find compromise. All right, no sodium chloride. You know, many things have been said about sodium chloride, that it was bad for the kidney, etc. So I, on only that slide, I want to show three facts. The first one here is a study that was done by Scott Brown and team. And here, what you have is the blood pressure with normality between be, being that dotted line. And you can see that from the lowest level of sodium that we tend to have in pet food to the highest level of sodium that we tend to have in pet food, there is a very, diff very little difference in blood pressure, if no difference for those uh, three first, no difference with the addition of sodium. In the same group, they did a work looking at uh, several hormones, and uh, especially the system uh, renin-angiotensin, and what they found is that with this concentration of sodium, the system of uh, renin-angiotensin was much higher, which is bad in patients with renal disease. And finally, this is a study that we followed over five years. The published paper is two years. We need to f publish the five years part, but here you have the five years figure, with comparing older cats, more than 10 years of age, with a diet at 0.4 and 1.3% of sodium. And you can see that the creatinine, the GFR, and many other compounds didn't change between the two groups. Actually, at the end of the five years, there were two cats alive, both of them on a high sodium diet. Potassium, it's very common for patients with renal disease to have uh, hypokalemia, too little potassium in their blood. Those cats feel very weak, they don't do very well. And so it's uh, very important to uh, fix that because a cat like that won't eat. Okay, so the potassium can be bring, brought by the diet. We have a higher concentration of potassium in our renal diet. If it's not enough, you can give it by fluids, you can give it as a supplement. The only issue is that potassium is toxic, so just monitor those animals because if you give too much of it, the cat is not going to do well either. There is some evidence that uh, cats with renal disease are on the low side of magnesium, especially at early stage of renal disease, and so there is some evidence that it might be interesting to supplement the diet of those cats with magnesium. 
as you know, the kidney is, remo is responsible to maintain the acid-base balance of the body. So if you have a patient with renal disease, that will not work very well. And so this is why we're not feeding those cats or dogs a diet that is acidifying. As I mentioned to you now, there is a possibility to make an early diagnosis of renal disease. What are we going to give to those animals? And this is the science today. That is, because we got those tools recently, we still do not know what is the best diet to give in a patient at early stage of renal disease. There are a few papers that have been published, but I recommend you to read them to realize that really the science that are in those papers does not allow to make a recommendation for patients at early renal disease. No, basically, you have patient. You have made a possible diagnosis of very early renal disease. What are you going to do? So basically, for sure, giving them a high phosphate diet is not a good idea. Adding EPA, DHA is not a problem. Antioxidant is not a problem. Probably we can give a bit more protein. We need to be careful with electrolytes. M additional magnesium might or might not be. So basically, if you think about it, this is what we have done for many years. It's called a senior diet. You know, for many years, we said for patients that are senior, we believe that I it's possible that uh, they are already in renal disease, so we tended to take that into account. And we have some preliminary evidence that if you feed senior cat with a high level of FGF23, a senior diet, that FGF23 is going to go down. So it's only preliminary result, but it's why today we recommend a senior diet for patients with early renal disease. All right, so in conclusion, there are two ways that nutrition will help patients with renal disease. The first is to slow down the progression of the disease, and the most important nutrients will be phosphate, and you will hear about that ingredient again, EPA and antioxidant. And then there are uh, quite a few ingredients also that are very important to help patients to improve their quality of life. And today, for early stage, more research is needed, and our recommendation is to feed a senior-based diet. Thank you very much for your attention.